Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support, please subscribe. The real cause of death of Lady Jane Grey. We all know the story behind the nine-day queen, Lady Jane Grey, and how she was removed from the throne by Mary I. But my question is, other than her execution being the obvious cause of her death, what were the actual events that led to her being there in the first place? What was the real cause of death of Lady Jane Grey? When Jane Grey was taken to her death, she was just 17 years of age. She had been queen for only nine days after the death of Edward VI. He had named Jane, his Protestant cousin, as his successor, instead of his Catholic half-sister, Mary. Now, a little bit of a backstory into Jane's life is vital to understand why she had been named Queen by Edward. It was common in the Tudor era for aristocratic children to be brought up in other households, especially if the foster family was of a higher status, as this would ensure that children learned etiquette and were in an adventurous position to find a suitable patron or to make a good marriage. Fostering such children enhanced a family's influence and their finances as there was money to be made from matchmaking. Jane was just 10 years old when she was placed into the household of Thomas Seymour. Thomas was ambitious and he realised that having Jane under his influence could be extremely profitable. Both Jane and Edward VI were still children, but when they reached maturity, Thomas planned to marry Jane to the king and around the same time in 1547, Thomas Seymour married Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's widow and Edward's mother-in-law. Catherine was close to Henry's children and personally oversaw their education. She was a keen Protestant and an educated woman, a patron of the arts and music and she made sure to share these interests with her stepchildren. Lady Jane Grey had blossomed into an intelligent, cultured and pious young woman and as third in line to the throne, Jane was a valuable asset, especially if she married the king. So naturally, Thomas Seymour wanted to keep her close. With the country in religious turmoil, Lady Jane Grey was third in line to the throne, so in a bid to prevent the ascension of the Catholic Mary Tudor, Jane was chosen to succeed the king. Jane was the great-great granddaughter of Henry VII, and she inherited the crown from her cousin Edward VI on the 9th of July 1553. Edward VI was just 15 years old when he fell ill with a fever and cough, and from then on his health remained volatile. Worried about the fate of the crown, he wrote on his device for the succession. Inspired by his own father's will, it took Edward several drafts to complete. The first version was written before he realised his illness was terminal. And in that version, he did not single out Jane as heir. Instead, Edward wanted, above all else, to ensure that his successor was male and Protestant so therefore he could disinherit his half-sisters Mary and Elizabeth in favour of the male heir of his cousin, Lady Frances Grey, or of her children, Jane, Catherine and Mary. But by June 1553, it became clear that the king was fatally ill, and since none of his cousins had yet produced a male heir, he changed his device in favour of Lady Jane Grey. Although Jane would reign as queen, the crown could only follow to a male heir and if Jane died without sons, then it would go to the sons of one of her sisters. Edward's second version was signed by the Privy Council and at least ten of the country's senior lawyers. This new version of Edward's device was highly adventurous to the King's protector, John Dudley, the Duke of Northumberland, and it may have been all a part of his master plan as earlier that year he had married off Jane to his son, Lord Guilford Dudley so that when Edward died, the couple would become king and queen. Jane was just 16 years of age when she married Guildford, who was 18. Now, it's important to remember that Jane was a victim of her father's ambitions, and he had arranged for her to marry Lord Guildford Dudley, the son of John, and John was one of the most powerful men in England. It was then only three days after Edward died, that Jane was called upon to accept the throne, and then on the 10th of July, she was proclaimed queen. But this was short-lived, 
as on the 19th of July, Mary I proclaimed herself queen and Jane and Guildford were now seen as the enemy and charged with high treason. Jane and her husband were then imprisoned in the Tower of London. Mary I was merciful and granted them a reprieve, allowing the couple to remain as a high-status prisoner in the Tower, and it is thought that Jane was held in number 5 Tower Green, whilst the Duke of Northumberland and his four sons, including Guildford, were imprisoned in the Beecham Tower. Jane had some comforts, she was attended to by three gentlewomen and a manservant, and was allowed to walk freely in the Queen's Garden at convenient times. In the November, the young couple were then tried and convicted of treason at the Guild Hall, and they were both charged with high treason and sentenced to death. But the Queen doubted Jane's guilt and said her conscience would not permit her to have her cousin put to death, but that all changed in 1554, and the Queen's staunch Catholicism and her plans to marry the hated Philip II of Spain had made her deeply unpopular and a series of uprisings followed, including the Protestant Wyatt's Rebellion in 1554. The conspirators didn't intend to bring Jane back to the throne, but Jane's father was involved in the plot, and this put Jane and her husband in a difficult situation. Jane's existence became more of a threat to Mary, who could not afford to let her live. We also need to remember that in the January of 1554, Jane's father joined a rebellion that intended to prevent Mary's marriage to Philip of Spain and replace Mary with her half-sister Elizabeth. And although Jane had no knowledge of the rebellion, her fate was sealed and all possibilities of a pardon were shattered. Mary offered to spare the lives of Jane and Guildford if they converted to the Catholic faith, but, always pious, Jane was by now a passionately devout Protestant and both refused. Then, with great reluctance, Queen Mary I accepted the Privy Council's advice and ordered the execution of Jane and Guildford. Guildford requested to meet up with Jane one last time, but she refused as she felt it would cause less misery and pain if they waited to meet shortly elsewhere and live bound by indissoluble ties. Then, on the 12th of February 1554, at around 10am, Guildford was taken to Tower Hill, where a crowd was waiting to watch him lose his head. And from her window, Jane saw his headless body being carried back to the chapel. It is said that she exclaimed, Oh, Guildford, Guildford. Being a woman of high status, Jane was granted a private execution within the Tower grounds an hour later. Dressed in black, the young woman remained calm as she walked the scaffold on Tower Green. A final word was dignified, and among them she said, Good people, I am come hither to die, and by a law I am condemned to the same. The fact indeed against the Queen's Highness was unlawful, and the consenting to unto by me. I do wash my hands there of any innocency before the face of God, and the face of you, good Christian people, this day. I pray you all, good Christian people, to bear me witness that I die a true Christian woman, and that I look to be saved by no other means, but only by the mercy of God, in the merits of his only Son, Jesus Christ. And I confess, when I did know the word of God, I neglected the same, love myself and the world, and therefore this plague or punishment is happily and worthily happened unto me for my sins, and yet I thank God for his goodness that he has thus given me the time and respect to repent. Lady Jane Grey then read Psalm 51 in her prayer book. She had asked the people gathered to assist her with prayers whilst I am alive, she would have no prayers said for the dead, a clear demonstration of her faith. After kneeling down, she recited the psalm of Mesere Me Deus in English, and then she gave her gloves and her handkerchief to one of her ladies. The prayer book was then given to the lieutenant of the tower. The executioner stepped forwards to help Jane untie her gown, but she refused, ordering him to leave her, as she preferred the help of her ladies. Her gown, headdress and collar were then handed to her ladies. The executioner then knelt in front of Jane and asked for her forgiveness, which Jane most willingly gave. 
It was then that Jane was directed to the stand, where she saw the block for the first time. She quickly turned to the executioner and asked that he dispatched her quickly. She then knelt down and asked, Will you take it off before I lay me down? To which he responded, No, madam. Jane's ladies were by this point so distressed to help her any further, so the final task of tying the blindfold over her eyes was left to the poor girl to complete herself. Now plummeted into darkness, she began to feel for the block. Unable to locate it, she panicked and cried out, What shall I do? Where is it? But no one, not her ladies, nor the officials, nor the executioner, moved to help her. They were all as though frozen by the heartbreaking and pitiful scene that was unfolding before them. It was then that an onlooker in the crowd stepped forward, possibly appalled by what was unfolding. A scared seventeen-year-old girl, frozen and blinded with fear, guided Jane to the block. Jane then, with her head in the curved aperture, spoke her last words. Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then, with one swing of the axe, Jane's life was gone. A young woman with such potential extinguished. Some time before nightfall, Jane's remains were buried in the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, near to those of her husband and two other fallen Tudor queens, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Eleven days later, Jane's father, Henry Grey, met the same gruesome end, and he was buried near his daughter and son-in-law, a tragic family reunion. The death of Jane is a very sad one, but she ended up where she was through the manipulation she suffered by others. A Protestant queen was better than a Catholic Mary, and Jane, unfortunately, became the woman for the job, only to be imprisoned and then executed for it. So the real cause of death for Lady Jane Grey may be that she was executed, but actually, if we look a little bit deeper, it's down to the manipulation of the men that were in her life and the fight between Protestantism and Catholicism. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.